Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting of the Committee on Health and Human Services to order. Um, it is uh, Wednesday, February 1st, 2023, and we have one presentation and one bill on the agenda today. Uh, we do have a quorum present, and Senator Bolden is uh, participating remotely today. Uh, first on the agenda, we have a presentation from the Department of Human Services, and they will be discussing um, their planning for the end of the COVID-19 continuous coverage requirements. Um, we wanted to have them uh, or give them an opportunity to, to discuss in more detail this uh, work that's going to be um, going on in earnest now in a few months, and there's been a lot of planning that has gone into um, getting ready for that point where they will start to actually um, take action. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, the committee has a good understanding of all the work involved and, and what will be um, taking place. So I appreciate your coming today. And we have Cynthia McDonald, Assistant Commissioner and State Medicaid Director, and Karen Gibson and um, uh, Cynthia, or Ms. McDonald, if you'd like to introduce yourself for the record and begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Wicklund, um, and thank you, members of the committee, for um, having us here today. I'm very pleased to be here and to talk with you about our work and the plan and what is uh, headed forward. So I am Cynthia McDonald. I am the Assistant Commissioner at DHS for the Healthcare Administration and also uh, very pleased to say the State Medicaid Director uh, for the State of Minnesota. Uh, with me is my colleague, Karen Gibson, who is the real expert. Uh, Karen has Ms. over McDonald, 40... Ms. McDonald, you, can you speak into the mic a oh, little I'm sorry. bit? That's might, better, yeah, and be really close to book, it. Maybe, let's see yeah. if I can get to it. <laughs> Thank you, is that that's better? better. Yes, it does sound Should better. I start again? Or? Um, no, you can, if you can continue. Okay, Thanks. very good. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce my colleague, Karen Gibson. Karen is the Director of the Healthcare Eligibility and Access Division at the Minnesota Department of Human Services. And Karen is truly the expert in Medicaid eligibility and has been part of eligibility policy either at a county level and long time at the state uh, for over 40, 40 years. Um, uh, in this, so uh, clearly an expert. And, and by the way, that is a, an expertise that is pretty much within the eligibility unit. We have a lot of expertise, which is very helpful as we talk about the topic ahead. So DHS is, has been preparing for the resumption of the renewals in public health care eligibility and the programs uh, for many, many months, uh, really since the uh, start of the pandemic. Renewals certainly are not new to Minnesota. Eligibility renewals are not new. This is a regular part of our programs, um, both with the, the, at the state level and at the county level and at the tri with the tribes. However, there are some challenges coming out of the pandemic uh, that certainly make restarting the renewals uh, and the process around that unique in, a, in this day. And so that's what we'll talk about today. Like all states, Minnesota maintained health care coverage for its Medicaid enrollees during the pandemic. And since March, we have uh, gained, uh, since March, Minnesotans who newly gained eligibility or already had eligibility in Medicaid, which we call medical assistance here in Minnesota, uh, uh, or in the Minnesota Care Program, have remained enrolled, regardless of, the, of most changes in their lives as they have gone through the pandemic. Typically, it's an annual process. We are now into uh, two and a half plus years of, of this level of stability. So continuous coverage helped Minnesotans access care during the global pandemic. It helped the state maintain high insurance coverage rates and allowed the state to receive billions of dollars of additional federal funding under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the federal act, which was the first major, major uh, federal stimulus package passed by Congress. It stipulated that continuous coverage provisions had to continue to the end of the COVID public health emergency. So with continuous coverage in place, enrollment in medical assistance in Minnesota Care in Minnesota has grown by more than 330,000 people um, to a total of 1.5 million people in our state that are on uh, public programs, which is an all-time high, of course. Uh, one in four residents living in our state now get their health coverage through our public programs. 
Uh, Congress passed the Consolidation Appropriations Act at the end of, actually at the very end, I think it was December 29th of 2022, and that decoupled or untied the continuous coverage provisions from the end date of the federal public health emergency. So before it was tied to the public health emergency at the end of December, now it sort of stands alone, if you will, within uh, that other federal law, the Consolidated Appropriations Act. So instead it ended the continuous coverage effective uh, March 31st, we now have a date of March 31st, 2023, um, and with it, a phase down of the full, what was the 6.2% increased federal Medicaid, medical assistance percentage funding, or that federal funding, also called FMAP. Um, eligibility redeterminations now may begin uh, pers pursuant to this federal law as early as April 1st of 2023, and we have 14 months then from there, therein. Once, once that clock starts ticking, uh, 14 months to uh, totally initiate, as it's called, and complete all the applications, or all the renewals, I'm sorry. Um, states remain eligible for the enhanced federal funding through 2023, so it, it runs out through 2023, 2023 and it phases down then throughout that year. Um, so I mentioned the renewal challenges and um, I'd like to focus a bit on those today, not to dwell on them because uh, that's part of what planning is all about is to work through those challenges, but to highlight those because I think given this unique situation, I think an awareness of that becomes really important. So as I mentioned, since the pandemic began, the number of enrollees has grown, and so, so has the work then to complete the renewals. With the continuous coverage requirements in place, the law requires workers to refrain from acting on any changes that could negatively affect eligibility. So those changes were not entered into the state's eligibility system pursuant to the federal law and pursuant to us being able to uh, uh, attain that federal funding. As a result, the data on file in the eligibility systems then has grown out of date, making the number of cases that automatically renew based on data retrieved from the electronic databases drop significantly. And consequently, this adds to the volume of renewals that, manu that workers must manually process. Uh, the work for the eligibility process for medical assistance, that work is done at the front line uh, by, a, by hardworking eligibility workers at all, their, all of our counties. So all 87 counties, that's where that happens uh, with state support. And, um, and then the Minnesota care uh, component piece is done by our state staff. Um, so just, to, just it's a critical distinction because that county state relationship in this process becomes even more important than it, than it otherwise is. Um, and, and then in the meantime then, because there is this uh, increase of volume of renewals that workers must process manually, uh, we are hearing from counties that workforce issues are of concern and uh, they are concerned about understaffing around that. Eligibility is complicated work um, and um, it, to, to, you can't just sort of bring in someone from the outside to do eligibility. There's a training, heavy training component that goes into that and understanding systems. So renew, resuming the renewal process will be particularly challenging since many enrollees are likely to have moved, changed jobs, experienced other changes, had a child, had a divorce. Uh, that must be considered in the renewal process uh, as it relates to eligibility for public programs. So those who gain coverage during the pandemic are, are unfamiliar too with having gone through a renewal process and new workers uh, that have been hired have never processed renewals in the same sort of regular fashion that has gone on for years. Um, and then even experienced workers haven't really had to do this for three, three years, uh, which is a long, a long gap in that, uh, you know, in, that, in that world of eligibility. An unprecedented volume of renewals that need to be completed combined with this tight uh, labor market that has produced wage, uh, worker shortages which has the potential to create bottlenecks in the renewal process that can cause gaps in our process. A second uh, challenge is around uh, systems and economic impact. So renewals are paper-based in our state and rely on postal mail. So no capabilities currently exist for texting, although we're working heavily on that, for emailing or online eligibility management for enrollees. And again, we're working on, on that system component, uh, heavily working on that uh, with our Minute partners as well uh, to, to uh, continue to improve and enhance and, and understand possibilities within our system. 
Much of the everyday work performed by staff relies on long, complex uh, set of instructions to receive correct eligibility determinations and then significant IT needs um, that ha have been necessary, uh, to be honest, for some years um, is now coming to, coming to fruition here where uh, that eligibility process, that IT systems within our eligibility system um, is, um, is um, uh, something that creates a challenge for us. Uh, similarly, systems, issues, and workarounds uh, for data and, and, re and requests for reports uh, then can subsequently become challenging. And uh, a high loss of public health care programs coverage could cause an increase in compensated care and additional stress um, in, our, in our system. Uh, a third challenge to highlight is around um, health and well-being. And so when renewals resume, some enrollees will inevitably come off public program coverage, which could be a good thing. Perhaps they've gotten a job and, and moved forward in their lives um, or some other change in a positive way. But um, there also could be people that, that not only that uh, beyond those that no longer meet the eligibility requirements, but may lose uh, coverage because of barriers in the process. So this includes failure to receive notices or return paperwork. Uh, you'll recall it's a paper-based, postal-based system. Uh, paperwork getting lost and other issues that relate to their actual eligibility status. So the loss of eligibility coverage has historically been evidenced by what's called a churn, the in and out of uh, eligibility. So maybe you didn't get your paperwork in, you churn off, but you, then you get it in and then you churn back on. So it causes the disruption, uh, certainly in care. Uh, we are working uh, to understand right now what the impact of this churn rate will be to, en to um, enrollees and, but, uh, are under within Minnesota, uh, but nationally estimates on the number of Medicaid enrollees uh, based on a Kaiser Family Foundation study, which does a lot of work in uh, researching Medicaid issues, uh, puts it at about a 13% average of the people who may drop uh, in coverage. A loss in coverage for Minnesotans can create barriers in accessing things like uh, COVID-19 vaccinations and treatment or immunizations, preventive screenings, prescription drugs, uh, care to manage chronic conditions, and um, accessing mental health and substance use disorders, just as a sort of a, a list. Um, and these negative impacts, I think this is a really critical point, these negative impacts may worsen existing health disparities in Minnesota. We cover more than 40% of Minnesota's children in uh, public programs. Four out of 10 births in the state are covered under Medicaid. And we cover elderly, much of the cost of elder long-term long care, and people with disabilities receive, by and large, their care through uh, Medicaid. Enrollees are disproportionately black, indigenous, and people of color compared to the general population. And so you can see that can add to what is already uh, uh, concerns around disparity. So with all of that kind of heavy news, um, um, so where are we headed? What's our plan? And what are we working on? Um, just uh, real quickly, just guiding principles is that we are, um, that we have defined and are working toward is uh, we are maintaining cover with the goal, sorry, three goals. Uh, maintaining coverage for all eligible enrollees without interruption. Uh, complying with the evolving federal guidance. I'll talk a little bit more about that, what, how we are working with our federal partners. And then minimizing the work burden on that workforce, particularly with our county partners and tribal partners on processing uh, renewals. So there's, there's a, a lot to this slide, but I'm just going to highlight that in the interest of time. So basically, here's what we're doing. We're taking the population of, of the uh, Medicaid population and dividing it into 12 cohorts, or basically one group a month. Uh, this is a plan uh, that has been approved through the federal government, through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, and this is the plan that we have been working toward. So it takes, so in other words, that big chunk of enrollment comes in, we can break it through, and it helps us manage then, it helps us, meaning us, the state and the counties working together, and the tribes who do the processing, uh, to be able to manage through on a month-by-month uh, -month basis. On this graph, you'll see that spike in there. I just want to make sure I highlight that. That spike then becomes how the Minnesota care component uh, that comes in. So the cohort piece that we're doing by 12th, by 112th is Medicaid. The Minnesota care uh, component, which is typically done through open enrollment in the fall, 
will continue with, with that. And we have permission from the federal government to treat it that way, sort of like, like we always do. And so that just indicates a spike when the Minnesota care piece gets added onto that. But if you'll recall, the, the st our state staff does the Minnesota care component piece. So we have, there's a kind of another team, if you will, um, working specifically on that. Uh, the first monthly cohort then uh, in this 1 12th view will likely come in July and I'll go through that a little bit more in the next uh, graph which has more of a timeline on it. Um, it, it, will, it will, so the, I think a critical point is the first time someone in Minnesota could drop off the program uh, or, or lose eligibility would be July 1st. But there is a system build and there are notices and all of that. So we actually will begin that process in March to work with that first cohort group to work that forward. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's a timeline and um, it's, there's a, a bit on this, but I'll highlight uh, just some of the pieces on there. So you can see that um, in 2020 and then throughout uh, as we move into 2024 when we're back to resuming normal operations, um, that um, there has been a, a lot of activity therein. So it's a whole holistic effort of, um, and a planning effort, and I'll talk a little bit more about sort of within that, what, how we're planning. Um, with, throughout, uh, to really in 21 and 22, um, th those years we have been dealing with about 11 different public health emergency extensions. And it's not a bad thing that things were extended for you know, lots of reasons, one of which is our readiness itself. Um, um, however, there's a start and stop to it um, as we prepared for the date. So actually at some level to have a date, I'll speak operationally, to some level to have a date that we now have to start no earlier than April and then be getting to plot this now on our timeline um, is helpful for that level of preparation. Um, Let me see, I'm just going to try and skip through some of the things that I wanted to save some time on for you. Um, um, we have, uh, all of this is done in partnership with the federal government, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. In fact, tomorrow we have an uh, important meeting with CMS to walk through our plan. They are doing that around the state. And by the way, I probably should stop and say, this is, a, of course, a situation that every state in the, in the country is going through. And uh, the concerns and the planning and the effort, uh, there are... Uh, 50 plus state Medicaid directors, people like me in each of the state, and that is uh, connected through also a national association, through the National Association of Medicaid Directors. So there's a sort of a tight link and support that comes not only through the technical assistance of the federal government, uh, through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, but also through the industry and also uh, in various groups that we um, also work through with counties uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so what's I think critical in here is probably in that uh, diagram around when do we start. As I mentioned, we will start in April to begin to um, ready for the, group, for the cohort one group um, and, um, and get ready for that for that first July uh, 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 implementation. And so there are various things, I won't go through all the detail of that, but there's a, a number of things, including notices that go out uh, to enrollees and renewal forms that go out and that connective piece. Uh, in order to uh, begin this process. And uh, as I mentioned then, what we hope to do is then, not hope to do, we will do, um, be back to normal processing uh, by June. As I mentioned, there's a time clock on this and um, CMS will be monitoring this. There's a, a heavy reporting obligation that goes along with this to CMS. It's monthly, but uh, a monthly re reporting process where CMS then will also be scoping with each state on where we stand uh, with things. So um, next, uh, I wanted to just highlight at, a, at probably a high level, I'm certainly happy to go in any level of detail, um, around what, I, what I'm calling the pillars of the unwinding plan. So there are six pillars I'll just highlight real quickly. So the first is uh, program policy and training. There's a lot of policy work that has to go on. Karen and, and her shop do much of that. So it's bulletins that go out, defining things, working with CMS to understand what are they, what is their guidance, what are they thinking, you know, what's their um, 
guidance and requirements um, on what we need to do. So working and coordinating that, uh, not only within our state process, but with our county uh, partners as well. There's a, a great deal of emphasis on training, as I mentioned, trying to ensure that we are responsive and connective to county partners to ensure not only renewal training, it, just to renew the training about renewals, but also um, to help with those new workers that are coming on to make sure that um, we, we are uh, readying for that. So that's, that would be examples of some of that uh, big pieces of uh, work within that uh, first um, pillar. Next is around measures and data. Just grab a little water. Measures and data, that's a really critical piece to this work. So we have a tracker, not only for ourselves as we run this program, but for counties, so they know where they are, for uh, the public, for all of you, for, who, for whomever uh, that will need to understand and uh, track this with us. So we're spending, obviously, a great deal of time on ensuring that we are able to provide uh, that level of information in dashboard form and in uh, more detail as our system allows. Um, third is around system readiness and um, understanding um, uh, the, uh, reviewing the system capacity and capability and understanding uh, the different pieces that we can do to help support that and, and pushing ourselves uh, and, our, and the system as a whole to understand how we can make this easier and uh, more, more streamlined. Again, I'll just remind us that these are, this is a process that has gone on for many, many years, many, many, many years uh, for eligibility determinations in public programs. But it, again, it's the volume and it's the coming at it uh, with, uh, with the level of and intensity of information that is part of the distinction here. Fourth is, uh, the fourth pillar uh, in our plan is around communications and outreach. This couldn't, this is probably one of the most important pieces is to get the word out. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Get the word out of what do I as a uh, Medicaid recipient, what do I have to do? What am I supposed to be doing and when do I do it? That's kind of the essence of it. And, and what do you need? What are the papers that you need from me? And then how do we help support that? Um, so. Uh, developing and launching enrollee communications has been a really big component of this, spending a lot of time on that. And we've got, I'm happy to say, some really great materials and great process uh, heavily underway on that, but much, much more to go. And in particular, we are uh, the plan to drill very deeply, if you will, into communities to ensure through various forms and means and uh, stakeholders to help with carrying that message out. There's a lot of cooperation, a lot of interest, um, and a lot of uh, really strong intent uh, to help in this effort, which is uh, very great. Um, we are um, <clears throat> developing toolkits and materials for counties and, and tribes um, and um, working with health plans who hold a number of the enrollees uh, in our system. About 85% of people in Minnesota are in managed care plans. And uh, also the really great navigator program that we have in this state who are uh, dedicated people to help, um, help not only help people with applications, but also are helping, will help get the word out about what needs to be done. Um, we're developing a crisis communication plan. By that I mean if something goes wrong, we want uh, an, an instant ability to be able to then address that issue, whether it's supporting a county or, or at the state level, uh, you know, dealing with issues around that. Um, and um, the, the continued community outreach piece and that interagency collaboration also uh, becomes very, very important. Um, and the fifth pillar is around enrollee support. Um, and it's uh, supporting the enrollees on the mind. We continue to explore the best way to uh, utilize data and partner, as I mentioned, um, but also then working with identifying core components of renewals like address verification. That's, because, that's a really critical piece, obviously, in a, in a, uh, in a paper-based system to be able to have the right address for, for someone and to be connect with them. Um, but are also looking at how to improve accepting verifications of income through other programs. Right now, they are not, we don't have an integrated eligibility system for other programs, and that's, that won't happen in this uh, period of time. But certainly looking at um, what we can maybe do around, for instance, the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and uh, a CASH program, how does all that fit into our strategy around our support um, 
for this. Um, let's see if I can move us forward a little bit. Um, the uh, what's what's I, you will hear my consistent emphasis on connecting to counties and supporting counties uh, because of their front row seat in, uh, in in their work around this. I won't work through all of this unless you'd like me to. But um, the we have a ten point plan. It might even expand more than that. But at this point, a ten point plan around uh, county support. So I mentioned training already. Uh, really critical are the venues that we have to collaborate. There are natural connective pieces to counties every day uh, where the state and counties work together, um, but also creating those extra pieces where we really need to be able to um, connect together. An example, just one example is uh, on Friday, um, we had a, a held a big listening session across for all counties across the state to call in and um, have our uh, contractor Deloitte, who is a partner with us in this whole process, and I'll talk about them in a minute, um, to um, listen independently it, so Deloitte could hear them, his state staff stepped out so the counties could have their voice and, and raise concerns around and it. And the input uh, received was uh, pretty much in the themes that um, we have certainly been talking about in other forums, but, um, and, uh, but it was really important to hear that uh, fresh voice in there. Um, Additionally, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, um, the uh, customizable uh, communications comp uh, pieces of, of, of uh, materials that counties can use that's been very well received. We spent a lot of time on um, ensuring that we've got a campaign uh, around uh, materials to, uh, for addresses and uh, other pieces of this. Also, this, the help with processing renewals, uh, what, what kind of support, how do we connect with counties so the state, the state will have its own job to do around Minnesota care, um, but how do we help then support that? So there's a, a great deal of effort that goes on with, with that um, to help support that. And um, in, it, this is not to be overlooked, uh, is the staff wellness. We must keep, um, we, we must keep um, staff both at the county and at the state healthy. And healthy as in healthy, uh, I, I would say physically certainly, but certainly emotionally too. This is gonna be a big, this is gonna be a lot of work. And so keeping people um, in, a, in a way and working through that deliberately to have kind of a wellness campaign around that I think is really important. Um, I mentioned the communications piece. You'll you see on the slide the kinds of examples. We're happy to provide any examples to any of you that uh, you, you would want to see. But these are materials that are deliberately uh, built uh, for this process under the address campaign, which is a, there's different phases of our uh, communication plan. But uh, being very deliberate about posters or um, uh, flyers or information, and uh, counties can uh, put their label on it and um, also use that so there's a direct access um, for members too. There are different phases. I could walk through all of, all of those pieces, but basically phase one is about addresses and update your address campaign. Phase two is about renewal, providing renewal information and getting beginning now to get that out there. Um, and um, especially as we begin to approach the uh, first cohort uh, group and how we do that. Um, cr creating public dashboards, uh, dashboards of all sorts, but public dashboard too, so we can uh, be held accountable within the public zone of how we are uh, tracking on this and how we're doing. Um, then phase three is around the actual notice of resumption of renewals and the communications around that. Phase four um, is around uh, working on things like uh, crisis communication, contingency planning in case there are bottlenecks. Um, uh, targeted community outreach, and again, targeted work uh, technical assistance with counties. And then phase five will, would is part of the coverage because part of the uh, process around this is if people do come off coverage and are no longer eligible, and ensuring a runway, a glideway into um, uh, the Mincher program. And uh, we are heavily coordinating with Minsure as well as part of the entirety of this to try to ensure that we enhance the opportunity for people to be covered. So uh, just in the last part of uh, my presentation, uh, just to talk about then, so um, tangibly, what are we doing from a, a budget perspective on proposals uh, within the governor's budget to ensure uh, coverage? So I'll highlight um, uh, just a couple of them. Um, so um, 
we know that uh, renewals uh, present one of our biggest challenges. It's actually the uh, U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Becerra, has said it's the biggest challenge since the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So it gives you a sense of that lift and uh, what has to happen within these next uh, within this next year plus. Uh, DHS has put forth some legislative proposals that help eligible Minnesotans um, retain uh, access and coverage for those who are eligible. Um, and we'll need resources around this uh, lift to provide a smooth transition. And we'll need, respectfully stated, we will need these resources as early as possible that as can be acted upon to ensure that we've got this uh, rolling along because April is not that far away. Um, so since the beginning of the pandemic, the state has received a net amount, so it's a net amount of about $1.8 billion uh, of enhanced federal funding as a result of the con continuous extension coverage under that federal dollar. Um, this represents the total value of the enhanced federal funding minus the cost of, the co of actually providing the continuous coverage. Uh, and the February forecast is expected to recognize uh, the additional funding. So DHS seeks to use some of this money then to ease the transition um, in, in this process. Um, so one of the first uh, critical uh, pieces uh, within our proposals are to give additional time, basically is to give additional time for Minnesotans who are disabled, blind, 65 or older that have, uh, ha that have um, had during this period of time may have had, had assets um, kind of build up uh, during this time uh, that they typically otherwise would do if you've heard of spend down. Sometimes they have, you have to spend down to get to the medical assistance level if you're in these categories of very vulnerable uh, folks. And so what we're looking for then is to have a little extra time for these particular uh, uh, populations to be able to ensure that uh, we are, they are able to work through that process. Um, so there isn't disruption of care, and again, emphasizing that this is, uh, you know, some of our most vulnerable populations, so to take that time to do that. Um, uh, next is, uh, an another one is around providing additional funding to the navigator organizations who are really a backbone of support for our public programs work. And so navigator organizations play, they play a really critical role in helping Minnesotans apply for public health care programs and also to renew their coverage. And navigators receive a payment for each medical assistance and Minnesota care enrollment via grant funds. So eat for each enrollment, they, they, uh, that's how they get paid. Uh, this payment model causes navigators to lose funding when continuous coverage provisions are in place and the volume of applications uh, uh, drop. Um, so that additional funding then would help in, help them help enrollees and help the process to be able to um, work through uh, and support the renewal process. And third and last will be um, adding administrative um, uh, support and resources to, to within DHS. Um, we run a pretty lean shop within the uh, healthcare and the eligibility space in particular as one of those backbone core Medicaid component pieces that uh, we are responsible for. Um, and so it's to strengthen that support. So it's things like overtime dollars. It's things like adding uh, some additional uh, uh, ASME workers who are the folks who do the enrollment processing. It's uh, people who answer the phones. It's that kind of support um, that is necessary within this, um, within this uh, work. Um, also, it's important too that uh, we, um, in, the, in the law that we give DHS, the DHS commissioner, Commissioner Harpstead, then the flexibility to respond effectively, especially with the ongoing uh, 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 guidance that is continually coming out of uh, CMS to ensure then that we, um, that she then is able to uh, temporarily adjust things or um, work through bottlenecks as necessary with a level of flexibility, all under the guise of federal law, of course. So looking ahead, um, uh, we, um, the situation continues to evolve and new guidance, for example, just came out from CMS Friday. So it's, we've had two guidances come out um, since the federal law change at the end of December where it decoupled um, this process from, uh, from the Public Health Unwind. So then we had a guidance that a couple of times have come out and we're expecting uh, quite a bit more as CMS themselves uh, uh, determines the path forward. Um, 
So we're working hard to work through that and understand that guidance. They tend to be a little thick uh, in terms of how we work through, you know, and understanding that work. And it's uh, important to say, though, and again, emphasize, we know how to do renewals. The system knows how to do renewals. Um, but it's been a while. We're rusty. And so we're working hard uh, 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 to get getting back to it, but face these challenges. Uh, they're not, they're not uh, insurmountable challenges, but they're a level of reality uh, as we work through the next year plus. Communications, as I mentioned, are critical. Uh, following, uh, working with MDH, following that playbook that has already been in place for COVID um, and, and working through and using that as a blueprint uh, in many respects, for instance, on who they connect with uh, in the communities uh, and ensuring that we are uh, 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 successful in that. And then coordinating with CMS. CMS is doing work on a federal level on national address campaigns, so ensuring that um, we are coordinated around that. And then ensuring that we're working closely uh, with uh, uh, providing information to you, uh, but also to others, uh, many others, uh, as we work through this. And I think, I think that comes to the end. Um, so um, it's a lot. I realize it's a lot there, um, but certainly happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much. I, yeah, I appreciate the detail, <clears throat> having it available, so we understand kind of what's going on at each stage. Um, might have more questions as we as we go forward and um, in terms of what some of these details mean. Uh, members, you have questions? Um, Senator Abler, did you? Thanks, and I have three, and I'll try to make them kind of quick. Um, so um, you mentioned there's some money in the February forecast that's going to cover this. Uh, some of these, you may just mention that as a one comment. How much is picked up in the forecast in terms of cost and some of the programming that you have here, just on the short side. I don't want to take too much time. Yeah, and you I might that. call upon uh, my uh, legislative and budget colleagues to maybe, because it feels like you need a specific um, response around that. Anna, well, you can just let us know. Um, oh, and okay. then, so that we, I, mean, if you, I don't know how much depth you want to go into, Madam Chair. It's a very large bill with many testifiers. So mm -hmm. but it's interesting to follow up on that. Absolutely. Second question I have is um, you're, there's some money in the budget pages, I think. Like there's no budget pages tied to this. So just there's some specific things you, things you want to do that are going to help, which I'm not going to ask you about now. But it would be helpful for me to know if you, how many people, if you do all that stuff, how many people are going to fall off? If you don't do any of it, how many are going to fall off? Um, and I think that's in, you know, in the programs that you have. And even though there's a lot of money, it's, there's lots of things to buy. And my third point, and one that I've just been close to my heart for a long time, you talked about helping the eligible people with their spend down, delaying the asset changes. Yes. And we finally hit 100%. Um, and it seems to me the fix in real life is to get rid of the spend down altogether uh, when the ACA came forward, we were able to, if you were simply low income or poor, you had no spend down. If you happened to have, unfortunately, have a disability, you had to live with 75%. We got it to 100 in a bipartisan way. And so just to put a push toward that spend down causes nothing but trouble for people who have, like, the most minimal of resources and the channel, most challenge. And so it would be interesting to see what it would cost to fix that. Um, so that's compared to what you're going to spend with just delaying. So thank you, Madam Chair. And so I'll be happy to take those all offline, but thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner, did you have a, any, anything you wanted to say, immediate response yeah, to Yeah, Madam Com Chair, um, uh, Senator Abler, I, I think those are all really critical points. And uh, so the, I'll just start with the last one, the spend down piece. Yeah, that is a challenge piece, and it's a recognized challenge for poor people and for for older people. So we'll uh, take a look at that and understand that a bit more, see if we can come up with that. Um, uh, the second point, just around the, the tracking of that data piece, that's a heavy, heavy focus for us because it's, it's fair you're asking that uh, it, with our system and extracting data out of that. Um, it's, it's a little more difficult, but we will have that. And, um, it is something that most of state Medicaid programs around the country are struggling with is to come up with that because everyone asks that. What's, what's the number? What should we anticipate? So uh, the best number at this point is probably around that 13% that I mentioned that Kaiser has come up with. But we'll be very focused on that, and we'll be back to talk about that. Thanks, Senator. I'm just looking Senator for you know, cost effectiveness. And mm -hmm. I think our, you'll discover uh, it's hard to put a budget together and another few hundred million or 20 million extra 
kind of goes a long way for something else you might want to buy. So thank you. That's true. Um, just on the the numbers, you know, in terms of um, those who are declining in enrollment, do you think, do you have any sense of whether um, that cohort, the 12-month cohort model, is that going to help you kind of, I don't know, anticipate where you're having more issues or see results within a cohort and that will allow you to adapt, you know, processes if you're seeing um, something that you don't expect? Yes, Madam Chair, I, that's a very, very good point. That's part of the sort of the good thing about dividing into the cohort piece. Not only is just the management of it generally, but also um, just understanding we 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 believe we will learn a lot in cohorts one, two, three, and uh, mm -hmm. really then can get to a more a more streamlined approach around that. Learning more, account, working with counties, learning more, and uh, and be able to um, be able to determine. Um, and use that, I guess, uh, as we move forward around that, um, if that fully answers your question. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's yeah. a very good point. Thank you. Um, Senator Utke, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, first one I have for the Assistant Commissioners, you mentioned the amount of money coming into the state, but I couldn't hear what that amount was. Could you repeat that, please? Madam Chair, Senator Aki, it's one, $1. 1.8 billion is the net amount uh, that um, that has come in, and that that's uh, uh, part of the equation then of uh, the dollars that came in minus then what was actually spent on covering people, and so that net amount is 1.8 billion. I'm sorry, I apologize if you couldn't hear me. Oh. Senator Aki. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Not a problem. I just. Uh, I was listening to that, but I couldn't, wasn't sure what you had said there, so thank you. Um, and I'm sure this is part of it, but rather than to assume, I wanted to ask, as you're going through the 12 months of the renewal process and getting everybody requalified, the people that fall off, um, next step is tr traditionally going to be Minsure or those type of applications. That open enrollment is open for those full 12 months then, because traditionally the open enrollment period is a month or a couple months, one time a year. Um, there's provisions for it to be open then continually for this 12 month period. Commissioner? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Utke, I'm going to just ask my colleague uh, Karen Gibson, who, if you can address that, I think that would be helpful. Uh, good morning. Ms. Gibson? Good morning. Um, uh, Madam Chair and Senator, um, yes, there is a special enrollment period when people lose medical assistance coverage that they can transition um, over to the qualified health plans that are available through Minsure. Um, the um, SOSIO, the, the, C, the, the federal agency that oversees sort of the exchanges, also recently issued guidance about extending that special enrollment period, giving people more time to transition if they need to over to a um, qualified health plan um, in which, and in some cases, they may be eligible for advanced premium tax credits. So Minsure is taking a look at that and they will be kind of sorting through that particular issue to see how much time that can be allowed to give people to transition from a public program over to one of their plans. Senator, Thank you. Senator Rutke. That's it. Um, just on that topic, um, is the special enrollment period, is there a minimum time for those? Is that a 60-day window or, I mean, is there a yeah, standard Madam time? Madam Chair, I, I, those details I don't know, but we okay. can follow up and uh, work with Minsure to get that to you. I think it would be helpful to know, um, you know, as someone reaches that point of, finding out that they're not eligible to continue in the programs that they're in um, and they have to transition, it'd be nice to know. I'd like to know, you know, what is that time frame that they have to, to make the transition to a different product. Um, thank you. Um, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, congratulations once again, um, you know, of being the Medicaid Director of the State of Minnesota. And as you know, when you see one Medicaid plan in the state. You've seen one Medicaid plan in the state. That was a, an Alan Bergman quote of 20 years ago, and I never forgot that. Having said that, 
there was a time in, during the pandemic where we as a body over here were trying to take retention dollars and we got, we got um, guidance, actually we got an opinion from the director of Medicaid, um, not in the state, but federally, CMS, who had said, you know, if you just allow your state to be able to ask for retention dollars, we're not gonna put you on the hook for the state match to that. And, and hence there was a number of states that were doing that and they were doing that first and foremost uh, in, the, in the nation because their Medicaid director had the ability to decide how Medicaid should roll through a state. And it was really um, odd for Minnesota, at least for me, because one phone call to a Medicaid director on the West Coast, um, pick a few states over there. It's north of California, it's south of British Columbia, that gets you down to two. Um, and the, uh, the state that I'm talking about um, is the same as the first president of the United States. So now that tells you which state I'm talking about. So when we, when we talked to that Medicaid director, they were one of the first to really take these retention dollars. And it was 36 million in Minnesota is what we were doing. And we passed it in the body of the Senate three times, like 67, zero. And it was not, it was just running into brick walls because there was some statutory issues that were involved. And I, and I just want to ask you this, part of your plan to look at guidance or looking at, you know, redoing your, the Medicaid, how it's done in Minnesota, are you going to specifically look, and, and let me just go back to the one Medicaid director, when I asked him if, if he had to get state approval, he said, no, I'm the Medicaid director. I mean, it was just, you know, it was a simple, kind of a simple statement, which is like, hmm, how are you going to, do you look at your, what you need to be able to do, and you have a huge amount to do. Other states, Medicaid directors are able to, through their own ability, start to move how Medicaid is done, specifically when we're talking about people with disabilities or, or elder population. Are you looking at what brick walls exist within statute that don't allow you to do the, the job that you are fully intended or should be doing in the state? Is that something that's sitting in front of you? Commissioner McDonald, it, or it does sound like a question that might be broader than what we want to cover necessarily today, but I, I mean, I'm, I hope if, if you have more information than we can cover, we do need to move to the next, to the bill that we have on the agenda, but oh, please that, feel. That's fine, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll, yeah. I won't remind people there's $1.825 billion in the surplus that should have been spent, which was going to be my second question, but I'll just save it for maybe this afternoon or some other time. So. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. I, I appreciate the work you're doing, and I would encourage that kind of bold leadership to, to occur in the state. So thank you. Sen Commissioner? Senator, Senator Wilkley, uh, Senator Hoffman, um, I ap appreciate that, that view uh, in terms of what sort of what do we need to do to ensure we've got a strong Medicaid program is sort of the core of that for me. And you're right. One program is, I mean, there's some level of consistency around the country, but it, Minnesota is unique, just like any state is unique in Medicaid. So I think the, I'm sorry, I am, I am not speaking loud enough today, or am I? And then, um, Madam Chair, that's because, you know, as an old drummer, I just can't hear, so you just, <laughs> so thank you. Um, but anyway, the, I think those are good points. I think we can certainly uh, think more about that, talk more about that um, as the uh, forum allows. Thank you, and I, I just wanted to make one other comment and then we'll move on to, unless, unless there's any other questions, but you mentioned that these proposals to ensure eligible, eligible Minnesotans keep coverage, that they're within the governor's budget proposals. And I just wanted to point out to people that the COVID unwind um, funding, that that is within the governor's budget proposals. And we would, and it's something that I'm anticipating that you would like us to review and take action on as, as quickly as we can to be able to access that funding. Would that be accurate? Madam Chair, that is very accurate. Yes. Thank you very much for raising that. I just think it's important to, uh, if, if again, with all due, with all respect, if that these can be moved, uh, uh, earlier on, that helps us just, uh, add it into the planning process, uh, as we work through, um, you know, starting in, well, starting in April is the formal uh, 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 start date, if you will, but um, it would be very helpful to have these so we know where we are with that and then add it into our planning in these precious 14 months ahead. Thank you. 
thank you very much for coming and presenting to us. Um, I see the contact information is on the slides if people have more questions, um, and they can get in touch with Ann Bobst as well um, to ask questions. So thank you again for coming today. Thank you very, very much, Madam Chair. And I apologize for my quieter voice. I will be louder next time. Yeah. And no one has ever accused me too much of being quiet, so <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. Next, we will move to um, Senate File 388. Um, Senator Dibble here is here to present his bill. Hello, Madam Chair. Welcome to the committee, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you so much, Madam Chair and members. Let me find my notes here. Um, and Senator Dibble, I. Do, do you have an author's amendment that? Yes, Madam Chair, the, uh, the A2 amendment. The A2. Which kind of combines, uh, Madam Chair, two changes. Senator Abler. The I'll move body. the bill and the amendment, whatever has to be done. So. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll move the amendment for the Okay, author. thank you. Uh, so that's being passed out. Um, Senator Abler moves the A2 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. The amendment is adopted. Um, Senator Dibble, uh, please proceed with your, your overview of the bill. Thank Great. You. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Um, I'll provide some opening comments and then uh, just do a quick description of the bill and then we have a few folks who would like to uh, speak about the provisions in the bill, if that works for you. Yes. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair and members. Homelessness is a human tragedy. It is the culmination of the failure of so many things. Try to imagine the circumstances of not having a house or apartment, a bed of your own, a bathroom, a kitchen, a place to be, a place to live. What will have happened in your life to create that situation? Maybe it was the loss of everything that provides security and stability and those things you hold most dear. Maybe you have a serious health condition, an addiction or a mental health condition with no real access to affordable, effective care. Maybe you or a loved one lost everything because of a catastrophic illness and the resulting bankruptcy, part of the previous discussion you had. Maybe your spouse or partner is violent and you've relied on them for money and for housing. Maybe you're an LGBTQ teenager who was rejected by their family for religious reasons or the level of abuse and harm from your family, your own parents, is so serious as to be a danger to your safety and to your sanity. Members, we live in one of the wealthiest states in the wealthiest country at a time in which we've created the most resources in human history. While at the same time, since the dawn of the industrial and then information ages, we have seen the highest concentration of that wealth in fewer and fewer hands. Just in the last two years, the top 1% of the most wealthy have accumulated literally two times the amount of wealth not on a per capita basis, not proportionally, literally two times the amount of wealth as everyone else. Homelessness is not something that exists in isolation. It is the failure of structures and supports and systems we rely on as individuals and as a community to ensure stability, safety, and security, a job that pays a living wage and a pay level that represents the value that that work is creating housing that is affordable, transportation that provides access, access to health care, to nutritious food, to a decent education and job training, to affordable child care, a secure retirement. But unfortunately, I am not here to solve all the problems of the world uh, and address um, all of those issues. I'm here to simply talk about the symptom of all of those failures. And all of that culminates in someone does find themselves without a roof over the, their head when the worst possible thing happens in their life. The bill I bring is an effort to simply respond to the emergency of homelessness that exists in our state and get people indoors, a bed to sleep in, food, care, and connection 
in the hopes that they can be safe and secure and ideally restore some of those things that would allow them to restore all those things we take for granted, ultimately a home of their own. And of course, the cost of not solving homelessness in Minnesota is so much higher in all the ways that you can well imagine in our healthcare system, on our criminal justice system, and on. But the lost opportunity is even greater when people cannot live and be their best selves and bring all of their talent and creativity nor fully participate in our economy, neither as workers nor as consumers. So Madam Chair, I'll turn my attention to the bill itself. Um, and it's made up of, of funding that would go into several different uh, categories. Uh, of probably uh, towards the end of the bill, you'll see the latter part of the bill, the largest aspect, which is emergency shelter facilities, in which uh, we would um, appropriate $150 million. Uh, and I'll just note, um, before it slips my mind, $4 million of that would go directly to uh, Simpson Housing Services, and they'll be up in a little bit to talk about why that's important and especially important um, to get those resources to them on a timely basis. Um, but the, uh, the shelter capital is based on the Minnesota Coalition for the Homelessness Statewide Shelter Need Assessment, which actually requests $200 million. Uh, the, uh, the individual grants will be limited to a maximum of $10 million per project, with 40% going to Greater Minnesota, 60% to, to the metro area. Um, and as the amendment showed, um, you know, if those dollars cannot be deployed in those proportions, they would go back into the pool and, and be allocated uh, where the requests are made. Um, we have uh, funds for emergency services grants. And of course, you know, once the facilities are in place, um, we have to support the ongoing operations, programs, staffing, and resources to support uh, families in emergency shelters families and individuals. The homeless management information system uh, is a key element of making housing connections for people without stable housing. The system collects information from all the homeless service providers throughout the state, uh, where resources are, where people are, trying to make those essential connections as well as tracking um, how best to deploy dollars and programs and services and the like. Um, and I'll just add parenthetically, um, this is a, a federal requirement um, as we manage our homelessness programs um, and we've fallen behind in, in maintaining and keeping up with that. Um, some uh, have expressed frustration because it's not actual direct services, but it is a very important aspect of how we make sure that our system is most efficient. Others have expressed anxiety about tracking individuals. That's not done uh, through this system. Um, and then, uh, Madam Chair, we have the Homeless Youth Act, um, which would uh, be 12.5 and 12.5 uh, million dollars. Currently, we appropriate 11.2 million dollars per year to the Homeless Youth Act, and this, uh, as you may be aware, provides grants to fund the whole continuum of services and care that are unique to this particular cohort of young people who are disconnected and unaffiliated with their families, disconnected from their families. The continuum starting from street outreach and drop-in centers to emergency shelter um, to all the kinds of, of things that young people would otherwise get from their communities and their families. Um, you know, making sure they have housing, they have healthcare, education, clinical services, connection to loving adults, meaning purpose and connection. Um, and a part of those resources would go to an innovative uh, initiative, uh, which we call Chosen Families. Um, as we know, uh, there are something on the order of 13,000 young people who experience homelessness every year on any given night. I'll say it's 4,500 on any given night. It used to be 6,000, proof that, that when we fund these services, we can bring those numbers down. Um, uh, we're never going to be able to house all of those young people in facilities and in shelters. Um, some of them actually have families or community members, loving, trusted, who care for them. 
many times those families simply can't take in another individual. So this provides support, resources, the ability for those uh, alternative arrangements uh, to be positive and productive for those young people. Um, and then transitional housing programs, which of course is that opportunity for folks um, to access temporary housing as they move from the crisis of being unsheltered, uh, outdoors, uh, homeless, uh, moving into a more stable housing setting uh, as they move on towards more long-term, uh, stable, secure, permanent housing. Um, and uh, Madam Chair, the reason why we're bringing this bill in this conversation forward now, um, kind of ahead of the larger budget deliberations which are to follow in a few weeks, um, is because getting these dollars out the door uh, takes time. And you know, the agency, uh, who I believe is in the room, and, and if you have questions about, about what it takes for them to put together the RFPs and get those, these dollars deployed, that takes a number of months. So getting the, the request for proposals and the grants made um, would, would put us towards the end of summer or into the fall. The agencies themselves, if they're gonna scale up to the level of need, need to be aware that those dollars are coming and they need to be able to um, stand up and ramp up services and that of course involves, not the least of which is hiring individuals who are well qualified and able to provide these essential services and we all know the problems and challenges we have in finding people to do good work. Uh, it's a challenge in every sector and every endeavor across Minnesota, not, and that's especially true in this particular area. And so getting the dollars ready, getting them out the door, and then getting these agencies the time to, to build to the capacity that we need so we don't go through another winter like this winter with literally thousands of people um, young people who are not necessarily outdoors, but in very, very inappropriate settings where they're being exploited, and many, many other folks who are simply uh, outdoors and suffering dire consequences of homelessness. So with that, Madam Chair, um, if we want to move to testimony and then revert back to questions and discussion. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Yes, if we could move to the, the two testifiers that are um, your, your testifiers, Rhonda Otteson and Beth Hol Holger, or Holger. Good morning, uh, welcome to the committee. Please um, state your name for the record and, and begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Wicklin and members of the committee. My name is Rhonda Otteson, Executive Director of the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. Our mission is to generate policies, community support, and local resources for housing and services to end homelessness here in Minnesota. We have 70 member organizations from across the state. We're also a member of the Homes for All Coalition. I wanna start by thanking Senator Dibble for chief authoring this historic investment as well as the co-authors for their support in this bill. At MCH, we work with advocates and leaders in every region of the state. In particular, people with lived experience of homelessness are essential leaders in identifying the challenges and more importantly, the solutions to address homelessness and housing instability in Minnesota. Listening sessions, rankings and selecting key priorities for our policy agenda and playing key roles in our advocacy are just some of the ways that these leaders with deep experience impact our work. To start my testimony, I wanna be really direct. We have a homelessness and housing crisis here in Minnesota. We have record numbers of peer, people experiencing homelessness and an affordable, accessible, dignified home is getting further and further out of reach for too many of our friends, family, and neighbors. I wanna share a few statistics about homelessness and housing instability here, just as some level setting um, from the Wilder Homeless Study from back in 2018 and the Homelessness Management Information System. On any given night, there are about 20,000 people here in Minnesota who are experiencing homelessness, and about 50,000 people will experience homelessness this year. Unsheltered homelessness uh, grew and increased by about 62% between 2015 and 2018. Children and youth are almost half of the number of people experiencing homelessness at 46%. <coughs> Seniors are one of the fastest growing segments of the homeless population, um, which grew 25% between 2015 and 2018. Homelessness is a deep equity issue. 
according to recent um, data from the HMIS system, black Minnesotans are about 6.5% of the state's general population, but represent 36% of people experiencing homelessness. Indigenous Minnesotans comprise about 1% of our state's general population, but represent 18% of people experiencing homelessness. Individuals identifying as LGBTQ make up 4% of our state's general population, but represent 11% of people experiencing homelessness. We have done a statewide uh, need, needs assessment for shelter capital, which is one of the big pieces of this bill that we're advocating for. There are 86 projects across the state that need new resources to create a new shelter, to acquire a space and rehabilitate it, or rehab dollars. This would allow 3,500 children, youth, individuals, and families to be impacted through these, the preservation or new projects in their community. Allowing culturally responsive shelters, domestic violence shelters, youth shelters, and gender affirming shelters to thrive. We need shelter spaces that are safe and designed to meet the specific needs of, our, of the shelter guests they're serving. We know that 80, at least 80 of 87 counties here in Minnesota lack enough shelter space to meet the need. The state of Minnesota has never had a program to invest statewide in, in across shelters of all types. And the current lack of shelter capacity really reflects this. Shelters want to address the most basic deferred maintenance. We are talking about HVAC systems, a roof, plumbing issues, um, updating accessibility for people um, with mobility challenges or sensory needs, and creating spaces that are private for families and guests. They just don't have the resources to do so. Along with the capital resources needed to create and preserve shelter spaces, Ongoing operating resources are essential to staff and operate these shelters. The Emergency Services Grant Program funds staffing and operations of shelters and funds motel vouchers in areas where shelters don't exist or are not available or at capacity. It also provides street outreach funding for on the ground folks connecting people to resources like folks in encampments. MCH applauds this multifaceted bill um, in Senate File 388 to make the desperately needed and long overdue investments into the Shelter Capital Emergency Services Grant Program, Transitional Housing Programs, the Homeless Youth Act, Chosen Family Ho Hosting, and the Homelessness Management Information System. Until we have enough safe, accessible, quality homes here in Minnesota, a robust and well-funded homeless response system is essential to save lives. I ask for your support on the Pathway Home Act. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much for the information and, the, and your testimony. Um, is Beth Holder here as well? Oh, there she is, okay. Um, welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I first want to be closer to oh, the microphone. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I first want to sincerely thank Senator Dibble for chief authoring this bill, but he has a long history of providing incredible leadership and commitment on the topic of youth homelessness and we cannot thank him enough for that. Um, I also want to thank there's several senators in the room that have been out to the link or other homeless youth agencies and have shown support to including Senator Abler and, and Senator Morrison and we just really appreciate that as well. So thank you all so much for your support. My name is Beth Holger and I'm the CEO of The Link. The Link is a youth and adult led nonprofit that provides a continuum of services, emergency shelter and models of housing for young people and young families experiencing homelessness in our state. We also, um, I also serve as the co-chair for the policy committee of the Youth Services Network, or YSN for short. And what YSN is, is a statewide coalition of homeless youth service providers. So I'm honored to be here, um, not just to represent the link, but our wider network of um, critical partners in this work to end youth homelessness. Could not do this work without them. So I'm here to support, as you can imagine, Senate File 388. 
Youth homelessness um, is a very real, real crisis in our state along with the wider topic of homelessness. We have on any given night 4,872 unaccompanied youth that are experiencing homeless in our state. And we have 312 youth dedicated emergency shelter beds. So you can do the math and tell that there's a big gap in, in what we have available for the need. We see young people at the link who are sleeping in entryways of buildings, trading sex for a safe place to stay or for rent. We see youth that are sleeping in their car in sub-zero temperatures. We see youth that are sleeping in encampments and so many much more horrific situations. We're also seeing, unfortunately, in the last few years, the severity of mental health crises increasing among the youth that are experiencing homelessness, increasing levels of trauma, increasing instances of domestic violence, and the impact of the increased gun violence has drastically impacted our homeless youth in our community. A few examples of that are that um, there was a young mother um, who has a baby, um, and the, the child's father, who's also her boyfriend, they were coming back to the apartment that they rented, and they were in the parking lot when the father and boyfriend um, was unfortunately shot and killed right in front of the baby and the young mother. This particular fa young family did not have people that were wealthy enough or could provide you know, immediate support for them. And unfortunately, what the landlord did, instead of you know, creating a GoFundMe and a candlelight vigil like we've seen in some, which should happen in these situations, and supporting this young, young mother and her baby, instead evicted her because the other tenants of the building were too scared. So therefore, she and her baby came into the Lynx Young Families Housing Program and we tried to not only provide support for them around housing so that they didn't have to experience homelessness while also grieving the loss. So that's one, one example. Another one is that um, of a young um, boy who aged 17, 16 or 17, sorry, um, his older, got in an argument with his older brother and the older brother then outed him as being gay to their mother who was absolutely against, um, against being gay. And so she then proceeded to start physically beating him inside of the home. And then when he ran outside to get away from her, she ran outside to the garage, got in her car. And as, he's, as her son is running down the sidewalk to get away from her abuse, she gets in her car and drives up on the sidewalk to try to run him down. So thankfully, he was able to get away from her and also get able to come into the Lynx LGBTQ um, homelessness program. So what I'm trying to say here is that these are, I could go on and on with all of these different circumstances, but they are happening in Minnesota. They're real, and these are young people that are in crisis that need our help. But as horrible as this is, there is some great opportunity we have in our state. So as Senator Dibble said, we are making progress. The Homeless Youth Act is the way to reduce and end youth homelessness in our state. Last time we had the $3 million increase in 2015, we saw youth homelessness go down during that same time period from 6,000 youth a night to 4,872. So by investing in the Homeless Youth Act, we have the ability to provide help to more of these young people and help them out of homelessness. So we know that the Homeless Youth Act works and it's the way that to do it. Um, the other thing I want to mention is by reducing and ending youth homelessness, we're also working to reduce and end adult homelessness and adult family homelessness. Over 50% of adults that are experiencing homelessness started as youth. So investments in the Homeless Youth Act are really going to help across the board in our fight to end homelessness in our state. So we have a huge opportunity here, and I'm just hopeful that you will um, choose to spend some of this surplus in ending homelessness. Um, I really appreciate your time and your support of these amazing, resilient, smart, hardworking young, young people in our state that have just had, unfortunately, horrific and tragic circumstances that are not their fault at all. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for providing the testimony. Um, I do have four people on the list um, who signed up to testify um, from the public. Uh, if we could have, let's see, if we could have two at a time come up. Chris was here. And Steve Horsfield. Welcome to the committee, and, and please introduce yourself and, and give your testimony. My name is Chris. Um, hello, Chair Ricklin and committee members. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you all today. My name is Chris, and I'm a single mom of six kids. 
I'm here today to share my story and struggles of being homeless. I ask you to take a breath and truly hear my words. My first experience being homeless was when I was a child, couch hopping and trying to stay with friends, but ultimately sleeping on the streets and play equipment at various playgrounds. The horrible things I had to do to survive, most could never imagine. From having to run drugs for the local drug dealer to forced prostitution, ending in beatings and forced captivity, just to have a place to sleep or food to eat. My life has always been tough. I never met my father and an alcoholic and drug addicted mother who sold me to men as a child and beat me on a daily basis was my childhood. If I was bad, my bedroom was an old tin shed. I was locked in unless serving a purpose to the family. And growing up in a time when mental health was not something you talked about has made me a but hid the suffering in silence alone. Yes, learning through my struggles has made me a stronger person today, and yes, I survived. So I worked hard every day the best I could, and I built a life, and thought my life was set. Married, had kids, owned a business, owned a home. But then it happened. And five years ago, I found myself trying to flee a domestic violence situation with my four children. After waiting three long weeks for a spot at the women's shelter to open up, enduring the abuse until the call came and I fled in the night. I was at that shelter for 28 long days, living in constant fear for our safety, sleeping in front of our door to keep my kids safe while they slept, in constant state of fight or flight. Until one night, they dropped me and my four children off in a different county at the front door of a hotel with a promise of housing that did not exist. If Miss Wanda, the amazing person working behind the desk at the hotel, had not known of Miss Rose of Oasis Central Minnesota, I would have slept that night outdoors, unsheltered and unsafe with my four children. We had nothing but the clothes on our back. When we were dumped in Morrison County, knowing no one, if not for Rose, I would have failed in finding safety for my children. If not for the nonprofit Oasis Central Minnesota. The next morning, Rose set out to find everything my children and I needed, from clothes to toys, food, and even birthday presents and a party for my child on his birthday. The 32 housing applications that she collected for me and helped me fill out and send out, even though I had a clean criminal record, a clean rental history, it proved to be extremely hard to find housing. We were in that hotel for five and a half months, four kids, two dogs, and myself in one room. I was a homeschool mom to my children before I had left. They were not allowed to attend public school before because of my abusive, narcissistic ex-husband and abuser. But Rose helped me to get the kids signed up for school, which is actually hard if you do not live, but live in a hotel because you're not considered a resident. You need an address. But we didn't have one. We were homeless. So it was a fight that we won. My abuser, my now ex-husband, was still receiving benefits for five months after leaving him, even though restraining orders were filed and granted, and I proved over and over we were not living with him anymore. Not even in the same county, but a button could not be pushed to end his benefits because agencies cannot communicate. So we actually could not move forward and start our new life. I actually had a county worker say, well, are you sure you're not gonna go back? Most people like you do, and it's a waste of my time to change the paperwork if you're going back. But after four years, 43 court hearings, and eight different judges, I have never went back. 
Living in a hotel with four kids wasn't itself a challenge. Yes, we had a roof over our heads, but the safety of my children was always still a worry, as I had no control over the type of people that also stayed at that hotel. Preparing and storing food in a hotel is challenging. There's only so much you can make in a microwave, especially for children. It's hard to prepare well-balanced meals or even just healthy meals when you're trying to store your food for five in a mini fridge. Having to wash your dishes in the sink and letting them dry in the tub as you have to keep the plastic dishes that you find or get with your food. To trying to find a place to wash laundry. It took so long to find housing as there was nothing available for four kids and myself. Shelter is more than four walls and a roof. We need a home to move forward. But then after five months of the hotel, I finally found a place for us to start our lives. Stability and safety is needed so badly by children and adults alike. The constant worry to provide and to have an adequate home to raise my kids in was and is an everyday concern. We now survive on less than $400 in cash assistance a month, but myself and my children will never give up. And we will achieve, because where there is a will, there is a way. With passing the bill, SF388, Oasis Central Minnesota could move forward and their plans that would increase shelter options by acquiring their own building or build a building, but they need shelter capital to make that happen. That's why supporting this bill is so important. It will be a space to be safe and successful. There needs to also be supportive services in all areas by people with lived experience training and continued education for staff and caregivers and providing a central location to provide information and services would be amazing. To create a safe space to help and support some of the most vulnerable people to be successful is so needed. Because of my experiences, I have become an advocate for other fighters and survivors in my community. I hold a seat on the Catholic Church Social Concerns and Advisory Council as a homeless survivor with lived experience. I currently hold a board seat as a community member on the Emergency Food and Support Program, EFSP, in Morrison County. I helped Helping Hands 365 bring Toys for Tots program to Morrison County for the first time ever officially in 2022. And we provided toys and food baskets for the holidays. We've serviced 486 children with toys for them to open at Christmas with 92 food baskets as well. I've also been part of another organization called the Holiday Gift Giving Program in Morrison County for three years. In helping battered women, single moms, and anyone who asks to fill out housing applications, paperwork for county or for schools, but most important, I help provide a safe home for kids. I fight for the children who are being hurt and affected by our lack of a system every day because of the experience of homelessness or abuse. Kids all know that Mama K, myself, does not judge, but I support and I love in any way I can to provide them a safe space for them to be successful. I've been a volunteer coach for everything from baseball to soccer, football, basketball, for elementary age children in after school and summer sports for 22 years now, and still am to this day. I offer individual school tutoring for children when they need it, as well as basic life skills training for kids trying to survive their circumstances. But most important to me is I help those in my community who are going through a tough time. I have lived experience and it allows me to connect as I was a victim. But now I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor of domestic violence and I'm a survivor of homelessness. So I have a 
level of understanding as I can relate and hear them on a level that many cannot. I was actually homeless over this past Christmas with five kids. Oasis helped me out, and for nine days, we were in a hotel. But after nine days, we got my heat fixed, and we were back home. By me having stable housing, it has allowed both myself and my children the opportunity to thrive and the capability to do all we do. My children all receive great grades in school. They are encouraged to be positive in their life and who they meet. They all play sports year-round, as well as my oldest is in speech and student council. My 10-year-old daughter is here today, hoping to speak to some of you as well. I also require all of my children, everyone staying with me, to do 10 hours a month of community service, to help them learn, to help others, and expect nothing in return, but to be part of a community. Most of what they do provides a benefit of knowledge in their lives as well. So I ask you today for your help. Make our system better. Please pass Bill SF388 so many like me who need help can get it and start to heal and move forward. Thank you again for allowing me to speak, and I am available if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your story and helping us understand um, your situation and why that bill is so needed. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, Steve Horsfield. Thank you, Chair Wickland and members of the committee. My name is Steve Horsfield. I serve as Executive Director at Simpson Housing Services. I'm here to testify in support of Senate File 388, specifically on the matter of cash appropriation for shelter capital. I'd like to begin by expressing our gratitude to Senator Dibble and our other authors. Um, I will also attempt to impress upon you the urgency of this request in terms of timing. Simpson has been operating shelter for more than 40 years where we serve about 500 guests each year and support more than 100 of them in their transition back to permanent housing in our community. One very important message that I hope you'll remember from my testimony, the most effective tool that we have for ending homelessness is emergency shelter. Specifically, shelter that has minimal barriers to entry, coupled with support services on site, this is how we move Minnesotans experiencing homelessness back into stable housing. For the first time in our 40 year history, we have undertaken a capital campaign and are ready to break ground on our new shelter and supportive housing facility. We are thrilled to be moving ahead with a model that serves with more dignity and accommodates the robust services that, that improve our housing placement outcomes. We have received tremendous financial support from the private philanthropic community Local government is at the table with significant, significant investments from Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis. The federal government has now stepped in with a significant appropriation, and we are here again asking for shelter capital support from the state. We have a shovel-ready project with construction be scheduled to begin in a few short months, and we face a $4 million funding gap. This project is well underway. Recently, we moved our shelter operation to an interim site in order to prepare for demolition and reconstruction at our permanent home. Timing is of the essence. Securing financial commitment from the state early in this session will allow us to lock in tax credit investment that is increasingly at risk as we get closer to May and June. We look to our state government for infrastructure investment. Capital funding for emergency shelter is smart investment and our most effective tool for ending homelessness. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Um, Senator Dimmel, did you have? Um, yes, uh, Madam Chair, I was going to ask uh, Mr. Horsfield to help us understand with a little more clarity this, uh, this timing issue with the tax credits um, and why it would be important, no matter what happens with this bill, for us to make sure these dollars um, get to, to this project so that it doesn't then um, cause them to come back and ask us for even more money if, in fact, this project is going to proceed. Mr. Horsfield. Madam Chair, Senator Dipple, thank you. The, so first of all, this, this project has the unique qualification of being one that is now asking for less money than, we've, than we originally did. Um, we brought this forward two years ago uh, with a $10 million request. We moved forward, forward, we found additional funding sources, one of those being a new market tax credit package, which is an extremely arduous process, um, but it is one that does net um, about $5 million 
in additional funding for our project. We have, since, the, the, since we've been working on this project for a number of years, we've, we've gone to market now uh, two separate times um, to, to acquire the, to accrue the necessary investors to make this tax, this tax credit package happen um, in this cycle. And the, these, these investors are required to expend their tax credits within a certain window. And as I said, when we, right now in the spring up to the early summer is the window. As we get, um, as we, as a closing date starts to slip out further than, than June, say, um, because uh, if we were to still be looking for how to, how to fill this $4 million gap, um, those, those investors are going to move that money to other projects in order to, in order to, to, uh, to meet their obligations to their, um, to their funding source. So um, what that means is that we're asking for $4, four million now. Um, if we are still um, trying to find how to plug this gap and still looking for state resources come June and July, that could go as high as $10 million uh, back to our original ask if we, if we lose this tax credit package. So very specifically, those are the, th those are the matters that are at risk, hopefully in enough layman's terms that it makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dibble, did you have any other comment? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that additional information. Um, I have two more testifiers, uh, Brenda Pritchard and Chastity Higgins. Welcome to the committee, and please uh, state your name for the record. And uh, Good morning. My name is Brenda Pritchard, um, and I'm here to support the funding for chosen family programs. Um, a little bit about me is I um, live in rural Big Lake um, with my husband, two children, um, and our four golden retrievers. Um, I'm not hoarding golden retrievers. We actually raise them. So, <laughs> um, And... A reason why I'm here too is support the program is I had worked in child protection in Sherburne County as a social worker for about uh, 20 years. Um, and, and, I, and I did also work with youth um, who were um, aging out of foster care and trying to set a program for them and trying to do a transition plan um, so they didn't end up homeless. However, in the last six years, I've worked at um, homeless drop-in centers with youth. Um, three of those years have been with um, Open Doors in Elk River, and the last three were Hope for Youth in Anoka. Um, and in working in those programs, um, I, I seen more of those aged out foster kids that ended up homeless, much more um, than I anticipated. Um, so <clears throat> I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Chosen Family Program. Um, and both of those um, agencies, I worked with the program. Um, the program is set up to help the youth who are staying with somebody who is 10 years older than themselves. Um, it could be a grandma, it could be a friend's family, um, they don't have to be related, it could be um, an aunt, really anybody that's stable and safe for the youth to be. Um, there's three tools that we use in regards to helping the youth um, in the program. Um, the first one is called the Good Fit Questionnaire. And that is something that I go over with the youth and we talk about um, um, who they're staying with, why they're staying with, um, and make, make sure it's a very stable and safe place for them to be. Um, another tool we use is the, um, sh the shared agreement. And that is when I sit down with the youth and the host that they're staying with. Um, and we talk about what are the rules of the house, what can the youth and the host bring to the table, um, what the youth needs help with, and maybe what the host needs help with and also the bottom lines in the sand. Um, one of the other tools that we found very effective is called the circle exercise. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this, but it looks like this. Um, and I work with the youth on um, who's there for me, who is their natural support system. And the middle circle, they will put people that are there always. Um, the second circle are people who are there sometimes. And the third circle is maybe, maybe those people can help them. And then out of the circle, they can put who's not in my circle. And that could be somebody who has been abusive to them in the past or an unhealthy relationship. Um, it could be a youth that is trying to stay sober, so they're staying away from their using friends. 
Um, and working with the youth, um, some of them will say, well, boy, I don't have anybody in my, in my circle. I don't have any support people there for me. But we continue to work and, and progress, and we talk about, okay, who's in your cell phone? Well, we find about 10 people we can add to the circle. Or we talk about um, you need $10 for gas or whatever. Um, who in that circle can be there to help you? Um, so the program is set up to help youth age 16 to 24. Um, for example, uh, an example would be is we had, um, we will call him Joe, a, a youth that I was working with, um, and he was coming to the drop-in center at Hope for Youth. Um, he identified as a 21-year-old black male, um, and he came to us saying that he had been staying with Grandma, who he called Granny, um, but he had to be out by the end of the month. Um, so meeting with Joe um, and talking to Granny, um, we found out that um, Granny was very concerned about losing her housing. Um, she had been living in this um, apartment for seven or eight years. Um, she didn't want to lose her housing. Um, Joe, at the time, he was sneaking in at night, um, you know, so people didn't see him. Um, not causing problems, but sneaking in, sneaking out. Um, so we came involved, we tried to preserve this existing arrangement because he had been staying there safely. Um, and one of the things that we do is we talk to landlords. Um, so I talked with Granny and got permission um, to talk to the landlord. First, Granny talked to the landlord. Um, then I talked to the landlord about um, the Chosen Family Program and how we can help. Um, basically, um, the landlord wanted no problems and they wanted the rent to be paid. Um, so with um, Chosen Families, we can help financially. So we were able to help Granny offset $200 a month in rent. Um, and the landlord was giving our number to call in case there were problems with the youth. However, there was not any problems with him. Um, so, um, sorry, I've changed this so many times because sometimes I have a minute, sometimes I have three minutes, sometimes I have two minutes. Um, so why we need funding um, is I've seen it work. In the last year, six years, I've seen it work. Um, and the youth find good and safe people to stay with like Joe did. Um, he found Granny. However, Granny needed some help with rent, and she needed um, to be reinsured that um, she wasn't going to lose her housing. Um, Another reason why we need um, funding is I had a waiting list at Hope for Youth. Um, there were so many um, youth that we could help. Um, uh, another reason is there's, it's a really good um, option for youth in the rural area. When I worked in Elk River, uh, we had no um, youth shelters. The closest shelter was Anoka or Minneapolis. Um, and the youth living in the small community, they didn't want to go to Minneapolis. That scared them a little bit. Um, so the youth would tell me that would be they'd be sleeping and hiding out in laundromats for a place to stay, or one of the youth told me he would stay in a biffy when it was raining or snowing um, so he could stay out of the weather. Um, so in conclusion, this has been very powerful and rewarding work. Um, the youth need more than a roof over their head. They really need people to care about them, and chosen families can help them with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for describing the program. That's really helpful. Um, is Chastity Higgins present? Okay, I don't, I don't see her coming forward. Um, I, that's all that we have on our list of uh, testifiers. Um, members, do you have questions or comments? Senator Utke? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm hearing some comments that might start to answer my question, but my first one is going to be, what is the path forward? What is the plan on this? Um, how does it fit into our budget? All of that. Uh, thank you, Senator Atke. I, I plan today, we're planning to have additional discussion time to get member questions answered. Um, also extended discussion time outside of the committee and, and I will be just laying the bill over for today. Okay, that's fine. Okay, because, uh, you know, and I guess we will, by laying it over, we'll have that chance to have further discussions because we know there's a need. Um, as I look at, and we've seen these bills in the past years come through, and they're all huge. Um, and it's, it's trying to fit that into the budget and get it to work. 
Um, and one thing that I guess I would like to see, and I've shared that with some that have come to me, um, and I know this is a housing for the youth, but the connection to other services to help get these people on to the next step, whether that be um, services with the SUD, whether it's the uh, substance use problems, um, and then an in, in inclusion with uh, an education factor, a job training particularly for the el older ones, and then something that gets them into, the, uh, into a job and starts getting them on the way to earning a paycheck. All of those things in combination with housing, I think we have to look at the full picture because it is a, a big deal. Um, but that, uh, we can continue that, um, and I guess by laying it over it, it does uh, um, answer some of the questions because I was concerned about where it fit into the budget and, and all of that. So we'll get that chance for additional conversations as we move forward, so thank you. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Senator Utke, to that last point you made about um, how the Homeless Youth Act connects to all the services and connections that you described, that's exactly what the Homeless Youth Act is. And so I'll be sure to make sure that the representatives of the Youth Services Network come visit you and or invite you out to uh, one of the agencies. Um, and I'll also send to you by email the, the text of the Homeless Youth Act so you can see that it is the identification of the continuum of services and all the things that young people need um, so that they can either return to their families um, or move on to, you know, to live in the present in a very healthy and dignified and productive way and also have a much, much better future. It's all about um, connections to, you know, um, all, all the things that young people need so that they get connected to work and to education and, and you know, health care and, you know, all the, it's not just a shelter and housing by a long shot. It's the entire uh, underpinning and, and, and substance of the Homeless Youth Act. Thank you. Any other questions, members, or comments? I don't, I don't see any others. Um, I, I do want to say just in terms of this bill is, it has a large dollar amount, but it also is con, um, contains several different entity or set, several different programs together. So I think that, you know, we're, we're trying to um, assess how to, to fulfill needs that are, are very urgent. And um, the programs that are included in this bill, I think have demonstrated that there is urgent need to get the funding and then also there's some particular needs to get the funding sooner rather than later so we can start to address um, address these issues in a meaningful way. Um, Senator Dibble, did you have any other um, comments? No, I, the final point I was going to make was the point I made earlier, which you just uh, reiterated. Um, it is unusual, to Senator Utke's point, to come with such a large, you know, almost $200 million um, budgetary item ahead of the budget process. I completely get that. Um, and so we probably need to answer those questions and you know decide all together if this is urgent enough and important enough to jump ahead of the normal budget process or not. I think it is, <laughs> obviously. Um, and for the reasons that I talked about. Um, uh, if we wait till you know mid-May, then um, you know all the all the effort um, that the agency needs to go to to ramp up takes time. Those RFPs, so that the agencies can apply for those dollars, then doesn't occur until you know late fall, or, and or even we're getting into winter, and then and then the agencies themselves need their time um, to to ramp up to stand stand up. That's the favorite word these days. Stand up a program, ramp up their capacity, hire people, and get get those uh, program services as well as the infrastructure the bricks and mortar in place, and we'll just, we're simply gonna lose another winter and people will suffer the consequences of the weather in Minnesota being homeless. Um, and so that's why we're trying to do this sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there are no other comments or questions, um, I really appreciate your bringing the bill forward and we will continue to have discussions. I think it is an, um, a topic that has a sense of urgency about it and we, and we do need to um, continue the conversation and I'll, I'm going to lay the bill over at this time and um, 
Members, we have no other business before us today, and um, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.